I'd like to play a game with you all. If you are willing and able, raise your hand and put it down when a piece of criteria disqualifies you. It's time to play Will You Become a Pilot? Ready? Put your hand down if you have imperfect hearing or vision that cannot be corrected to 2020. Put it down if you need allergy medication that makes you drowsy. Put it down if you have a history of diabetes, epilepsy, or perhaps have a pacemaker. Have you ever used antidepressant, anti-anxiety, or ADHD medication? Do you have a record of underage drug or alcohol use? And yes, that blunt you were caught with when you were 16 counts. Okay, so we've got a few left. Let's say you're medically a pretty perfect human being. Let's talk finances. Are or were you a financially independent college student? Are you unable to afford a $200,000 bachelor's degree? Or perhaps unwilling to spend five to six years obtaining said degree? Do you not want to work in a male-dominated white workforce? And ladies, are you unwilling to be called flight attendant for the rest of your professional career? There's about nobody left. As evidenced by the audience here, 70% of society will never even have the chance to reach the cockpit. This is because the perfect concoction of lifestyle choices and sheer luck required in order to meet the aforementioned standards is unrealistic at best, creating an environment where only essentially robots can survive. While ebbs and flows in the cycle that is the aviation industry are natural, today the severity of the difficulty of learning to fly has created an environment that only perpetuates our shortage. While the industry has noticed these issues and made active efforts to fix it, major changes in multiple facets will be necessary in order to fully remedy the issues quickly approaching down the pipeline. My name is Sarah Michalak, and like almost all of you in the audience here, I am unable to fly. Now, part of me wishes I'd been told that before I spent my life savings on flight lessons at the age of 17, but we can't all be that lucky. However, as a former flight student and a current aviation management one, I believe I've seen firsthand the various factors that take out hopeful flyers every single day. I myself was a flight student once upon a time. I had worked hard for it the whole nine yards, fresh out of high school with a 4.0 GPA, president to various clubs, a graduation speaker wearing enough cords to weigh her neck down. I'd applied for and earned thousands of dollars in scholarships and was working multiple jobs in order to afford flight lessons at my local flight school so I could get a jump start on my college curriculum. Things were looking good, and I was well on my way to achieving my dreams. It was the second week of freshman year when I realized I'd never become a pilot. My flight lessons had been temporarily paused because I was missing an important piece of paperwork. It's fine, my flight instructor said. This happens all the time, but it wasn't fine. The days of waiting for that paper to come in the mail turned to weeks, which turned to months, and before I knew it, I was off to school. And I was told by my advisor that if I wanted to start flight lessons, that meant that I had to be in the first semester, but if I didn't have the paper, then I'd be put on a deferred flight path, but if I was on a deferred flight path, I couldn't have the scholarship money, and then I couldn't afford it, and then I wasn't able to afford regular college, not even flight school, and then I was told that even if I wanted that piece of paper, it was going to take so much time, and hundreds of miles, and thousands of dollars of travel expenses, and even then, they had no clue if it was going to be weeks, months, or years, even if I could get the paper at all, and before I knew it, I was hundreds of miles away from home, thousands of dollars in student debt, and I am being told that I can't do the single thing that I came to college to do. And as I stand here on that stage, I can say that that is the single best thing that has ever happened to me. I was lucky enough to fall into the world of aviation management, a quick-witted and fast-paced business lifestyle that suits me miles, or should I say nautical, miles better than aviation flight ever did. But I was one of the lucky ones. The more I asked the question of why can't I fly, the more I found other people like me. And the more I realized that this picturesque image of blue skies and high salary piloting that we think of is a piece of propaganda crafted by the piloting industry in order to further stop their shortage. In reality, piloting was pr probably an expensive hobby best kept in my free time. But to understand all of that, we first need to look at the history of the pilot shortage. This isn't the first one we've seen, and by no means will it be the last. Put simply, your tickets are decided by two factors, oil and labor costs. When one goes up, the other must come down. And as anybody who has tried to fill a car with gas in the past year can say, 
Fuel prices are nothing but stable. Your car goes from $35 a tank to 82. <laughs> Stuff like this results in an industry where pilots' jobs are almost completely up in the air. Industries have to cut costs somewhere, and in aviation specifically, oil is a relatively stable one, and they can't negotiate that price, so that means that they have to cut the cost somewhere else, often in the salaries of pilots. And because piloting is a skill set, pilots are often fired and rehired overnight the second an economic crisis hit. Fun fact for all you out there who are into stocks, if you want to know where the economic industry is going, look at the airlines. They are the first telltale sign before anything else where it's going. As evidenced by this graph here by Bloomberg, oil prices are anything but stable, and thus so are piloting jobs. 9-11 to the housing crisis and the war in the Middle East to the pandemic can leave many pilots finding themselves unemployed overnight. So we know that aviation is cyclical, and about every seven years an economic crisis hits that threatens the job security of pilots. In fact, this is the major reason why every single pilot I spoke to has spoken to the importance of having other hobbies and jobs outside of flight. This is because in an industry as volatile as this, having a backup plan is important. It's the reason you'll be hard pressed to find a school that actually offers a bachelor's degree in aviation flight. Many will offer an associate's degrees or certificates for your flight and then a tandem bachelor's degree for either aviation management, technologies, or airport operations. This is because having a backup plan is important. However, the industry isn't the only thing that's consistently changing. So is its safety. This is why we act like your 3.5 ounce bottle of shampoo is the end of the world in TSA. But it pays off. Our safety measures have meant that in the past 10 years, there has been a grand total of two deaths on major airlines. In fact, we're all more likely right now to be hit by a meteor well indoors than we are to ever die in an airline accident. And that safety record is no accident itself. However, this isn't the only thing keeping pilots out of the cockpit. Today, the FAA is actually looking at legislation to help aid with that shortage. Certain safety measures are being put in place to ensure that single pilot cockpits are a thing of the future. Planes today can take off, fly, and land themselves. And essentially, we're moving towards a future where pilots become systems operation managers, present only as redundancies in case the systems were to fail. However, we're a long ways away from that future. Today, there are still multiple things keeping pilots out of the cockpits, one of the major ones being cost. I was able to compare some of the fees associated with flight from a student who attended SIU for a degree in aviation flight and management in 1988 and the same cost for a student pursuing those degrees today. And keep in mind, these aren't all the courses required for this degree. They're only a handful. And I'm not ashamed to admit it, but there is no stinking way I could afford any of that. And I hear what you're saying. These numbers aren't accurate, things change over time, inflation's important, to which I say they are adjusted for inflation. If you'd like a more jarring picture, here you go. In this case, costs have doubled, if not quadrupled in some cases, in order to learn how to fly. But let's say you want some of that good old fashioned work ethic and elbow grease that you think can get you everywhere. Let's try it. You work at your favorite red and yellow fast food restaurant for minimum wage for all four summers that you're in high school. You decide to work $13 an hour, you work the entirety of your summers, about 31,000. You say, I'm gonna kick it up during the school year. On top of my classes and academics, I'm gonna keep my job, work as many hours as I can get a week, extra $7,000, $38,000. You apply for some scholarships, you're successful at a few, keep in mind they take a lot of time to work for, and then you're offered some money from the university for a grand total of $50,720. Do you wanna know how far that'll get you in a university flight school? About one year. Put simply, piloting isn't possible anymore by pinching the family pocketbook a little tighter. The reality is, if you were not born with privilege, your hopes of getting into the industry are almost zero. And many are unwilling to admit it, but if you have a car that can reliably get you to the airport, if your parents financially support you in any capacity for school, and if you aren't aware of every single cent coming in and out of every single one of your bank accounts, you on some level have more privilege over others to become a pilot. However, let's say you have all this privilege. That might not even be enough to get you into the industry. 
This is because you will be, need to be able to obtain something called a medical degree, a certificate stating that you visited various doctors and were found to be free of a variety of the medical conditions that almost all of us have. <laughs> this certificate is difficult to obtain at best. In fact, I remember speaking to a flight student on the West Coast who attended a flight school but was deferred out her second year because she had a history of antidepressant use when she was 13. The words she said will forever echo in my mind. It feels like they're punishing me for seeking help when I needed it. And as harsh as that may seem, we need to look at the incident that inspired such legislation. In 2015, German Wings Flight 9525 crashed into the side of the Alps, killing all 80 people on board. The pilot had been struggling with suicidal thoughts and depression and bottled them all up, refusing to disclose them to his airline. He was scared for his job security. He didn't have any other skills except for his degree in flight, and if he lost his job, who would support his wife, his kids? What would his family do if he didn't have any transferable skills that didn't apply outside of a cockpit? So he decided to just keep bottling it up one more day, until one day, he snapped. Wouldn't you rather have a pilot who talks about their problems instead of bottling them all up? In this case, the legislation put forward to keep the industry safe failed and backfired, resulting in the deaths of 80. And here we have to ask ourselves, where do our values lie? Is it with the governments and the airlines who just want the highest safety standard possible and are willing to eliminate humans from that equation to obtain it? Or is it with the pilots who have a passion for flight and want to share that with the world? And the answer is a little bit of both and neither. I don't claim to know how to solve the pilot shortage. But what I do know is the exact piece of legislative red tape that my paperwork got caught up in and delayed me to the point where my opportunity window closed. And my story is not the only one. Think about it. Have you heard of anybody who's dropped out of flight school? Probably not. The amount of shame associated with putting your all, your everything, your money, your time, your effort on the line just to not be able to do that is one that people put on themselves when flight doesn't work out because the, it feels like there's so much pressure to win. Learning to fly has become more difficult than ever. And my story isn't the only one. Think of the student who dropped out of flight school because she sought help when she needed it. Perhaps the boy who is still waiting on a medical degree after a year and a half because he used to take ADHD medication. The student who dropped out after their first semester of college because they received their bill and realized they couldn't afford it. The girl who developed diabetes her senior year of college and instantly thousands of dollars Hundreds of hours of her time, her entire degree, and all of her licenses were nullified. These stories are more common than you think. We just don't hear about them. I'd like to ask you all a question. When I say aviation, how many of you think of this? I guarantee almost nobody. That's because we've crafted aviation into being a narrow-minded view of simply a cockpit, when in reality, it is so much more. It is blimps, it is drones, it is helicopters, it is hang gliding, it is hot air balloons. By allowing people the passion to get into these lesser known niches of aviation, we can find people who are willing to become pilots. We're in a shortage of passion, not a shortage of pilots. By introducing people to these concepts earlier on and allowing them access into the industry, by listening to the stories of people like me who weren't able to make it to better figure out where the gaps in the industry are, we can help to start tearing down those barriers that stay in place. And maybe one day, we can create an industry full of aviation where the 70% of us that had to put our hands down can someday become near zero. Thank you.